welcome to season three of Anti-Social Studies. We're back! For the last year, I've taken a break from pure history to dive into some current events, but this season we're going back to school. Throughout the next season, or school year, if you're a teacher or student, I'm going to go back through everything you should have learned in U.S. history class and nothing more. Whether you had a bad teacher, thought you were too cool to care about old dead people, or were distracted that year because you got your first boyfriend, I got you. We'll go through all the history you really should know without any oppressive textbooks or pretentious professors. And if you're bummed that I'm not covering current events for a while, don't worry, because I am. My Patreon members are still getting weekly episodes covering the news and historical context behind important current events. Go to patreon.com slash antisocial studies to join today. It's a great way to keep up with current events and also just to show your support if you like the content I'm creating. There's an education tier for teachers and students that's just $3 a month. I mean, a few bucks to be smarter than all your friends and coworkers? Totally worth it. All right, but now let's get to U.S. history. So... In theory, this first episode is covering everything that happened in the land that would come to be the United States before 1776. But that's insane! We don't need to know all of that. We can really understand all of U.S. history if we just look at two colonies and one year. That's right! Hello, oversimplification! Also, if you're sad that I'm not doing an episode on life in the Americas before Europeans arrived, don't be sad, because I already did an episode on that. Check out episode 6 from season 2 called 1491. But here's the synopsis for now. There were way more Native Americans than we previously thought. They had a huge impact on transforming their environment into a sustainable utopia that the colonists quickly destroyed, and anywhere from 90 to 98% of them died within one to two generations after Europeans arrived. Don't worry, we're going to talk more about the Native American experience throughout later episodes, but for now, let's look at the 13 original colonies. The main idea of today's episode, and really this entire season, is that from the beginning, America has been a conundrum. Because it was founded by many different people in many different places with many different ideas about what they were creating. In some colonies, they were taking advantage of a land of endless opportunity to create wealth regardless of name or birth. In other places, they were building a city upon a hill that would become the shining example of a true Christian nation. And in others, they were escaping the oppressive autocracy of Europe in search of a blank slate to apply new ideas about equality, liberty, and democracy. Sometimes these competing visions worked okay together, but as we'll see throughout the season, they are also often the source of our conflicts. So let's see where it all started. Welcome to Season 3, Episode 1, Colonial America, or Who Needs Dancing When You Have Tobacco in the Bible? This is Anti-Social Studies. I'm Emily Glinkler. Settle in and let's go back in time. Act 1, The First Colony, 1607. That was the year that the first permanent colony was established in the Americas by the English. For some context, Queen Elizabeth I had just died four years earlier, but the joint stock company that founded this colony would name it after her, Virginia, for the Virgin Queen. 1607 is just less than 100 years after Leonardo da Vinci died and Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the church, sparking the Protestant Reformation. Just four years before our country began to begin, the Tokugawa shogunate was formed, unifying the island of Japan. And in a lot of ways, our two nations rose up parallel to each other, culminating in our historic clash in the 20th century. The first wave of European colonization had begun after 1492, and it was dominated for the first century by Spain and Portugal. But now, partly thanks to Elizabeth's defeat of the Spanish Armada and a growing economic drive on the island kingdom, England was getting in the game. The economic policy in effect was mercantilism, and this stemmed from a new idea that the act of trade itself could generate wealth. Up until this point, merchants were fairly low on the social hierarchy in most civilizations. I see you, China. And they brought in luxury goods, but they weren't a prominent wealth creator on their own. But in England, with a new Protestant emphasis on individualism and a rule of law guarded by Parliament to protect them from having their wealth taken away, something that's much easier for a king to do with goods like tobacco as opposed to land, an early form of capitalism was rising. Private ventures were launched, although they had to be approved by a royal charter, to explore the so-called New World. Basically, wealthy men or families went in together on a new venture, making it easier for middle-class men to gain access to lucrative opportunities. 
They all jointly had stock in the success of the company, so they were, you guessed it, a joint stock company. Woo! As with most things, the Chinese had actually already been using joint stock companies for around 500 years, but the Europeans, especially the English, took them to a whole new level. These companies typically had a national monopoly on trade between England and another place, like the Muscovy Company, which controlled trade from Russia, or the famous British East India Company. These companies were highly efficient because they were backed by the crown and had little competition since royal charters weren't all that easy to get. Once these companies were formed and got hold of some land, they could kind of do whatever they wanted. Like, no wonder they were the bad dudes in Pirates of the Caribbean. Joint stock companies were extremely beneficial to the crown because the government could reap the reward of new trade ventures without having to put up the cost. You see, mercantilism also said that the mother country should be the primary and often sole beneficiary of any wealth generated by the new companies. So, when the Virginia Company founded the colony Virginia and began growing tobacco, for example, the only place they could sell that tobacco was back to England. And I mean, this is fine for now, but give it about 150 years and that's going to get pretty frustrating to some of the American colonists. Foreshadowing. Anyway, in 1607, the Virginia Company, armed with a charter from the new King James I, arrived in the newly named James River. It was marshy and humid, but the deep waters allowed ships to get close to the shore. The small outpost they founded would become Jamestown. Jamestown on the James River in honor of King James? How very Alexander the Great of them. The original goal for the Jamestown colony was to bring back gold and find a river route to the Pacific Ocean. Remember, the entire purpose of setting off into the Atlantic has always been to make it to China and India without having to go through the Italians and the Muslim Ottomans. They don't know it yet, but no one would ever find a river route connecting the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans because it doesn't exist. At least not until Teddy Roosevelt builds that canal in Panama. Sorry, spoiler alert. The leader of this venture in Jamestown was Commander Christopher Newport. He quickly had to deal with native tribes in the region, especially the powerful Powhatan Empire. The relations between the two sides were not always bad. They traded with each other, and the natives provided gifts of food in the early years of the colony, but tensions were always high, and encounters turned violent quickly. Under Newport's management, the colony's purpose was clear. Find gold and explore the land. He didn't invest much time or energy into building strong infrastructure to help the colony itself survive. Again, how Alexander the Great of him. He possibly believed that they wouldn't be there for very long. Go in, get gold, and get out of there. While Newport sailed back to England to report about the great start the colony was off to, the first mass casualties in the colonies were taking place due to dirty water, diseases from mosquitoes, and limited food. Dozens of colonists died, and people at the time reported that there were times when as few as five settlers were well enough at any given time to bury the dead. It was bleak. Even when Newport returned, he continued to spend most of the resources searching for gold. At the same time, the governor of the entire Virginia colony ordered them to construct a massive capital building, which seemed like an incredibly unnecessary waste of precious resources when they couldn't, you know, feed everyone. Eventually, the people agreed, and the governor was politely asked to leave. At that point, a young captain who had been railing against this mismanagement from the beginning took control. Oh yeah, I'm talking about John Smith. Ugh, I always imagined him with the voice of Mel Gibson. Damn you, Disney. John Smith's leadership can best be described as tough but fair. He ordered that those who are able but do not work will not eat. It's pretty simple. And it should show us just how treacherous life was in these early colonies that on Smith's brag sheet is the bullet point that, quote, no settlers died of starvation under his administration. Woohoo! Way to go, John! Now, very quickly, I would like to point out that Disney is absolute garbage when it comes to history. Like, we know this, right? They are what I like to call fictional history as opposed to the much preferred historical fiction. I love historical fiction, which is where writers take very real, well researched historical events or time periods and then insert fictional characters into that world. It's great, and if it's done right, you learn a ton about history through the eyes of a fictional character. Here's the difference. Disney takes real things and real people from history and then changes them around to fit a fictional story they want to tell. This is the worst possible way to handle this because people then think they know what really happened because it's close enough to actual events that no one digs any further. So everyone just assumes that Pocahontas and John Smith fell in love and were married or that there really is a hidden treasure map on the back of the Declaration of Independence. Ugh, they're fun, but they're misleading. So, John Smith was captured by the natives, and he was threatened with execution until he was, quote, saved by Pocahontas, the chief's daughter, at the last minute. 
But this was most likely entirely ceremonial, meaning Chief Powhatan wanted to assert his dominance over the new colonists, and this was a pre-planned performance to show A, his power, and B, his mercy. Now, John Smith might not have known this, so he was probably terrified. Pocahontas saved his life again later by warning him that her father had planned an ambush after Smith had threatened to burn Powhatan towns in exchange for food. When Smith left the colony soon after, Pocahontas was told that he died. Anyway, we'll get back to Pocahontas in a second. Eventually, the Crown stepped in more directly, partly because of lingering management issues, but also probably because they realized how lucrative the new colony could be. John Smith was forced to step down as governor, and he returned to England. More proof that John Smith was pretty good at not letting people starve. As soon as he left Jamestown, they entered the so-called starving time. Seriously, after Smith left, Chief Powhatan launched a campaign to starve out the English and try to force them out of Virginia. It worked, and during the winter of 1609 to 1610, over 80% of the colonists died of starvation. They ate dogs, cats, and some even dug up their dead and resorted to cannibalism. So, those were the early Americans. In the end, the 60 surviving colonists had packed up, gotten on ships, and were like, get me the hell out of here, before they were rescued by two ships with supplies and more settlers who had been shipwrecked in Bermuda, but successfully rebuilt their ships and made it to the colony just a little late. The colonists were probably like, wow, that must have been so hard to be lost and forced to live on an island in Bermuda. Meanwhile, we were literally eating people. From that point on, the Virginia colony grew more stable and began to thrive as a cash crop colony. The person most responsible for the growing wealth of Virginia? It's another John, named John Rolfe. He revolutionized methods of growing tobacco. Oh, and he also married Pocahontas. So here's the real story. After John Smith left, there was a general state of war between the natives and the colonists. In an attempt to win back English prisoners and stolen tools, a colonist kidnapped the chief's daughter, Pocahontas. He did successfully negotiate the return of the English prisoners, but Chief Powhatan refused to return the tools and weapons. Pocahontas stayed in an English outpost and eventually converted to Christianity so that she could marry John Rolfe. The marriage was most likely a political one, but it was successful. It brought peace between the natives and the English for the next decade. Pocahontas and John Rolfe, along with their baby Thomas, went back to England where she was greeted as a strange princess. And she supposedly saw John Smith again at a party and was overcome with emotion because she had believed him to be dead. But according to onlookers, she also chastised John Smith for his threats against her people that had led to all those rising tensions years ago. I mean, that is a movie I would watch. Okay, before I move on from Jamestown, there are two key events in its history that really matter for modern Americans, and they both happened in 1619. First, the Virginia Company introduced a very limited representative body known as the House of Burgesses. Eligible voters across the colony's now four towns elected representatives who could advise the royal representatives chosen by the king. And true, this mostly just reflected the basic constitutional monarchy model that existed in England, a parliament that advised a king, the king in this analogy being the head of the company, but this was the first sliver of democracy that was created in the American colonies. And, seemingly opposite to this achievement, the first enslaved Africans arrived in English America in 1619. Fifty Africans, men, women, and children, were brought to Virginia, and at least 20 were purchased by Jamestown settlers. So this is really interesting. From the very beginning, our nation was a strange mixture of new ideas about liberty and democracy clashing with racism and slavery. I mean, I'm sure that won't come back to haunt us. But wait... Some of you might be thinking to yourself, Jamestown wasn't the first colony. And to you, I say, quit interrupting. I don't go down to where you work and start shouting about the lost colony of Roanoke. But you're right. Historians are always careful to say that Jamestown was the first permanent English colony because there was, in fact, an earlier one, but it was significantly less permanent. But wait, even the Roanoke colony we're about to talk about wasn't the first colony. You're like, oh my gosh, stop doing this. Just get to the creepy disappearances. I will. But I think it's interesting that the very first English colonists in the New World, as far as we know, were a group of 100 men, including a team of scientists. They arrived in what would become Roanoke 1.0 in 1585, 30 years before the settlers at Jamestown. And they included a metallurgist from Prague named Joaquin Gans, who was also the first known practicing Jew in the Americas, and a scientist named Thomas Harriet. Harriet has been credited with introducing the potato to the British Isles, bringing some back from the New World, and Ireland thanks him for that, but he's most known as an astronomer. 
He was the first person to make a drawing of the moon using a telescope, and he did it over four months before Galileo. Cool. He had set up a small lab in the first Roanoke, but when the English assassinated a local indigenous leader, they were like, yeah, we got to go. Two years later, the next English settlers arrived, and they built upon the beginnings of a settlement in Roanoke that had been created by this first group. John White, oh man, so many Johns, became the governor of the new colony, and he sailed back to England to gather more supplies. But he was held up by a war with Spain that necessitated every man and ship to fight for England, so he wasn't able to get back to Roanoke for three years. It's a long time no matter what, but especially because he had left his wife, daughter, and infant granddaughter, the first English-born child in the Americas, Virginia Dare, in the New World. When he finally made it back, he reportedly found no trace of the settlers or even the colony. It was as if they had never existed, save for one clue. The word Croatoan carved into a wooden post. So what happened to them? I mean, that's kind of the point. Like, we don't know. The most common theory is that they were killed or abducted by Native Americans. Croatoan was the name of an island just south of Roanoke that was the home of a Native American tribe of the same name. So maybe this was meant to be a clue of where they were being taken? Others have proposed that they could have tried to sail back home and gotten lost at sea, or been attacked by Spaniards marching up from Florida, or maybe they just moved further inland away from the marshy land and were absorbed into a friendly tribe. That'd be kind of nice, wouldn't it? No, they probably all died. Sorry. What's fascinating to me is how little we still know about this so-called lost colony. I mean, it's 2019, we have the internet. But despite over 100 years of excavations, no trace has been found of the town. Most likely changes to ocean currents and rising waters flooded the site over the last few centuries, but nonetheless, archaeologists even today, as we speak, are searching for the true first American colony. Act 2. Protestant Puritans on a Pilgrimage to Plymouth. Oof. Jamestown and the entire Virginia colony was typical of what would become known as the Southern Colonies. Across the southern half of the Atlantic coast, colonies were mostly founded by companies, or by the crown, but for expressly economic purposes. This is in direct comparison to the so-called New England colonies, which were founded for entirely different reasons. To understand these differences, let's move from Jamestown up further north to Cape Cod. So, before we can understand New England, we have to understand Old England. Remember that in the 1530s, about 70 years before Jamestown was founded, King Henry VIII broke with the Catholic Church so that, among other things, he could divorce his first wife. His daughter Elizabeth formalized the new Church of England, or Anglican Church, which was technically a Protestant church, but it actually kept a lot of the same practices as the Catholic Church it broke away from. This angered some people in England who felt like the Anglican Church hadn't eliminated all of the problematic practices of Catholicism, and it still needed to purify itself. These people were called Puritans, and they were really annoying to the monarch and other leadership. Now, Puritan is still a pretty broad term because there were varying opinions on what needed to happen for the church to become sufficiently pure. But this growing movement found a lot of support with pretty much anyone in England who was growing frustrated with the oppressive power of the monarch, who also happened to be the head of that new Church of England. So much for separation of church and state, right? So, the growing middle class in the cities in England, merchants and educated professionals like lawyers, often became Puritans because it was inherently a more democratic version of English Christianity, and a lot of these people were chafing under all of the economic restraints that came with a royal mercantilist system. Now, some of these Puritans believed they should go further than just criticizing the church. They wanted to separate from it entirely, and they were called separatists. You see how this naming thing works? They began to create their own independent parish churches, and they would bring in lecturers, educated young men fresh out of college who had new ideas, not just about religion, but also about this whole absolute monarchy thing. Spoiler, they didn't like it. Okay, so these groups became problematic for the government, so they were kicked out. Well, not kicked out. They were treated so badly in England that they chose to go find a new place to live, thank you very much. They were done with the old England, so they sailed across the Atlantic and set out creating a new England. That'll show them. This is where the Mayflower comes in. Around 100 men and women, a large group of them separatists, landed on the shores of Cape Cod and anchored at Plymouth Rock. Fun fact, Plymouth was actually named by John Smith. Oh, hey again, John Smith! When he was down in Jamestown, he led expeditions to explore the coast and got as far as Cape Cod, naming stuff all along the way. 
So in 1620, 13 years after Jamestown, the first permanent settlement of Europeans was established in the northern part of the American colonies, a.k.a. New England. So the Plymouth colony was actually not super successful. Eventually, they would be absorbed into a larger colony nearby, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. But there are a few important things that we need to know about Plymouth. First is what New England Puritanism looked like. For one, it was really intolerant of other denominations of Christianity, let alone other religions entirely. The Puritans believed that they had it right and everyone else is wrong. Like, they wouldn't let anyone dance. So basically, colonial New England was the prequel to Footloose. I want to point this out because there's this idea amongst a lot of Americans that our country was founded on the idea of religious freedom, but that's not quite right. Our country, New England specifically, was founded on the ideal of freedom to practice Protestant Christianity. They were just as intolerant of other beliefs as in the old world. And that's not a good thing, but it's an important part of our nation's history that we have to acknowledge. But the way Puritan churches were set up also lent itself to a more democratic system than in other religions. Each church was basically independent and just loosely connected with other churches in the colony. This fragmentation made it so that each congregation had a level of freedom to interpret the Bible as they saw fit, which meant that a ton of different denominations branched off, Quakers, Baptists, etc., and that early New Englanders got used to a level of independence that would be hard to give up. More foreshadowing. The other key factor in Plymouth history is the creation of the Mayflower Compact, The early months of the colony were rough. Most settlers slept on the ship because it was safer, and they were all basically slowly starving to death until they met Squanto. For way more about him, check out my episode on Thanksgiving. Although the separatists were a minority on the ship, they were united and very loud, and so they dominated the group politics. Do I see the roots of America's infuriating democratic system? Out of fear that other non-Puritan settlers, who were referred to as strangers by the Puritans, how nice, would not adhere to the group will, they arranged a contract setting up a majority rule government that would make decisions in the new colony while still swearing allegiance to the king. That's the Mayflower Compact. And I want you to notice something here. When the settlers, especially in New England, arrive on the shores of America, they are quite literally on their own. I'm not counting Native Americans only because they didn't. So from their perspective, they were alone. It was pretty easy to do what you want. Set up a relatively democratic government, for example, and just say that you're loyal to the crown. As long as you kept trading with the mother country and stayed nominally loyal, you were fine. And this was how the settlers existed for the first hundred years or so. It's called benign neglect. England left them alone as long as they didn't cause any trouble. Again, foreshadowing for next episode when England is going to stop being so neglectful and Americans are not going to like it. But like I mentioned before, Plymouth remained a small, relatively unsuccessful colony. Maybe it's because they were all so uptight from keeping themselves from dancing. I don't know. Eventually, they would get absorbed into a larger colony that was established just a few years after the Mayflower landing, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. This group of settlers were also mostly Puritans fleeing persecution under King Charles, and they were led by John Winthrop. Winthrop, a lawyer and Puritan leader, sailed west in the spring of 1630, and on the journey, he wrote out a sermon called A Model of Christian Charity. He envisioned the new Massachusetts colony as a special sort of experiment that had a covenant with God and with each other to show the world what a truly Christian community could look like. He famously called the colony a city upon a hill with the eyes of all people on them. A little self-important, but I mean, he wasn't wrong. By the end of the decade, over 14,000 Puritan settlers had come to Massachusetts, and Winthrop would ultimately be elected governor 12 times. Under his leadership, the colony took a moderate, conservative approach to government. Well, wait, let me clarify. For the time, it was moderate, in that it was significantly more democratic than back in the old world, but from our view today, it was pretty conservative. He emphasized group discipline and individual responsibility to serve the community. He was very similar in this way to our guy John Smith down in Virginia. But he definitely wasn't progressive. In Massachusetts, only white male members of a Puritan congregation could vote. And to be accepted into a Puritan congregation, it had to be approved by those who were already in. This is another important note. Most people, especially educated elites, whether it's the King or John Winthrop or eventually George Washington, are terrified of true democracy. Winthrop called it, quote, the meanest and worst of all forms of government. Very few people in this time period believed that every single person should have an equal say. They saw that as just mob rule, which, I mean, based on our current political system, isn't necessarily wrong. 
But again, just like in Plymouth, there are important slivers of democracy that are popping up in the colonies, especially in the northern colonies. The colonies all established elected legislatures like Parliament back in England, and they prohibited ministers from holding public office, continuing to adhere, sort of, to separation of church and state. In reality, ministers had enormous influence in the government, but that wasn't always a bad thing, since ministers were often some of the most educated men in the colony. For example, Harvard College was formed in 1636, just six years after Massachusetts was founded, specifically to train Puritan ministers. So Massachusetts was conservatively moving in the direction of democracy, or at least a form of democracy that gave white Christian men more say. But there were some who took it even further. So now, let's look at a few outliers. Badass men and a woman, whoa, who took the American dream further than just economic opportunity or Puritan religious freedom. They saw the new world as a unique opportunity to create an entirely new society that could reject the hierarchy and divisions that had developed over millennia back in Europe. Can you tell they're my favorite? Act 3, 1636. So, I mean, I think we can all agree that the Puritans were annoying. They were strict, incredibly patriarchal, had a superiority complex, and ran the Massachusetts Bay Colony with the Bible in one hand and a note saying, stop dancing, in the other. Okay, that's my last dancing joke, I promise. But there are a few people who had issues with the very narrow version of freedom that had been established in Massachusetts, and they all acted on that frustration in the same year. 1636. First, we have Thomas Hooker. He was a Puritan lecturer back in England until he was forced to flee to the Netherlands. There, like many Puritans, he lived under the Dutch Republic, a loose confederation of states that allowed for a lot of independence. Those lessons would not be wasted on Hooker. He ended up in Massachusetts, where he became the pastor at the earliest established church in Newtown, later renamed Cambridge. Hey, Harvard. Thomas Hooker took issue with the limited suffrage in Massachusetts. Again, only free men could vote, meaning only individuals who had been formally admitted to their church after a detailed interrogation of their religious views. He eventually split with the Massachusetts leadership over the issue of voting rights, and he and a group of 100 followers left the colony and founded a new settlement named Hartford in 1636. His new settlement would eventually grow into the Connecticut colony, and he used this blank slate to create a more democratic society— Describing his new government, Hooker wrote, quote, They who have the power to appoint officers and magistrates, it is in their power also to set the bounds and limitations of the power through the privilege of election, which belongs to the people according to the blessed will and law of God. Quote. What this means is that elected officials have a duty to serve those who elected them, and if they don't, the people can limit or take away their power, quote, through the privilege of election. At his first sermon in the new colony, he declared that, quote, the foundation of authority is laid in the free consent of the people. You might be thinking, okay, yeah, cool, that's like how democracy works. But Hooker didn't know that because democracy didn't exist yet. He's describing a new idea that is being thrown around the highest circles of enlightened men at the time, the concept of a social contract between the government and the people in which the people ultimately have the power. That's revolutionary. And he wrote all this years before John Locke wrote his treatise on ideas like the consent of the governed and unalienable rights. This is fascinating because I've always thought that we straight up plagiarized John Locke in our Declaration of Independence and Constitution, but it turns out that these ideas were essentially native to America. These progressive democratic ideas have existed in some parts of our country since the very beginning, and I think that's awesome. Hooker solidified Connecticut as an enlightened colony with the passage of the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut in 1639. This document went further than the Mayflower Compact by establishing individual rights of all people in the colonies that must be protected by the government. In this way, many historians consider it the first written constitution ever that created a government from scratch. Historian John Fisk explained, quote, It marks the beginnings of American democracy, of which Thomas Hooker deserves more than any other man to be called the father. And it's true that the Founding Fathers drew upon Hooker's writings and the fundamental orders when drafting our country's official founding documents. Hooker's descendants also made history. This is one of my favorite things about talking about the colonies is looking up all the people who were descended from them because the colonies were so small and the elite was such a small, tight-knit group that really you get like a lot of names all in one. It's really fascinating. 
Hooker's granddaughter married James Pierpont, the founder of Yale University, an ancestor to James Pierpont Morgan, rich dude J.P. Morgan, and another James Pierpont who wrote Jingle Bells. Cool. Hooker's great-granddaughter married Jonathan Edwards, who's arguably the most influential theologian in American history. He helped spark the First Great Awakening, and he wrote one of my favorite primary sources of all time. It's called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. It's a sermon in which he compares humans to spiders being dangled over the flames of hell by an angry god. It's so fun to look at with students. Oh yeah, and his grandson was Aaron Burr, the guy who shot Hamilton. Whoa. Okay. So in 1636, Thomas Hooker left Massachusetts to found Connecticut on the principle of expanded voting rights and democracy. Yay! Awesome! In that same year, another Puritan minister also left Massachusetts to found his own colony. His name was Roger Williams. Random side note, Roger Williams always, to me, sounds like the name of a car dealership for some reason. Like, come on down to Roger Williams Toyota. Anyway. Williams lived in the Plymouth colony, but he was frustrated with the way many Puritans were conducting their new colony. He specifically called out their treatment of the local Native Americans. Roger Williams had started up communication with the nearby Narragansett Indians, and through that connection, he began to question whether the colony had been founded legally, since they hadn't purchased the land from the natives. What? An old white dude realized at the time how messed up it was that the colonists just straight up stole the land from the natives? That makes me both happy, like that some of the Puritan settlers were more woke than I gave them credit for, but also really sad, because then why didn't more people care? Hmm. After writing an essay that openly condemned the charter from the King of England as corrupt since no one had bought the land first, I mean, that's like treason, right? Roger Williams was politely asked to leave, and he moved to Salem. In the town, he was welcomed, but not in the larger Massachusetts Bay Colony, where his reputation as a troublemaker preceded him. Side note, he was the pastor of the Salem Church about 60 years before the Salem Witch Trials. I knew that's all that you were thinking about as soon as I mentioned Salem. Or the cat from Sabrina the Teenage Witch, but that has nothing to do with Roger Williams, unfortunately. Even though Williams was a Puritan, I mean, he actually founded the oldest Baptist church congregation in the U.S., he disagreed with how tightly the Puritans controlled the Massachusetts colony. He believed in a more true version of religious freedom, which eventually got him exiled from Massachusetts. He avoided the sheriff by slipping away from the colony during a blizzard, taking refuge with the local Wampanoag Indians who offered him shelter at their camp. Take note, kids, it pays to be nice to Native Americans. He spent the winter with various native tribes before crossing the Seekonk River, officially outside the Massachusetts Charter. In this new territory, he created a settlement named Providence, but not before he secured the land legally from the natives. He literally practiced what he preached and paid them for the land. Man, this guy was ahead of his time. His new settlement was intended to be a safe haven for anyone, quote, distressed of conscience. It basically became the island of misfit toys, populated by religious dissenters or any individual whose beliefs or opinions didn't match the Puritan worldview. So all the fun people, basically. From the beginning, the government was determined by a straight vote amongst heads of households. Newcomers could be admitted to full citizenship by a simple majority vote, and the town agreement restricted the government to only civil or non-religious issues. They also established an agreement that declared that Providence would, quote, hold forth liberty of conscience, All of this means that Roger Williams founded the first place in modern history where citizenship and religion were separate. You didn't have to be a Christian to vote, as well as a guarantee of religious liberty and separation of church and state. Other nearby colonies were not a huge fan of Providence, especially because Williams maintained close ties and friendships with the Indian tribes in the area. He was constantly called to mediate between settlers and Native Americans, twice surrendering himself as a hostage to guarantee the return of a tribal leader who'd been taken. Besides this suspicious affinity and respect for Native Americans, the other colonies, Massachusetts, Plymouth, and Connecticut, were worried that Williams' colony was too progressive. They considered many of his beliefs to be heresy and worried that it would spread like an infection throughout the colonies. Keep in mind that these were still the early days when survival was the most important question, so there were many leaders who believed that the colonies couldn't afford to grant true freedom to the settlers because it could risk the community falling apart. Out of this animosity and pressure, Roger Williams traveled to England to secure an official charter from the king for his new Rhode Island colony. On his trip to England, he also wrote a book, A Key into the Language of America. 
Published in 1643, this was a combination phrase book with observations about the life and culture of the Native American tribes of New England. Through his writing, he hoped to help new settlers better understand and communicate with the indigenous people, and he even went so far as to assert that the Native Americans were in no way inferior to Englishmen. Here's a poem he wrote for the book. Boast not, proud English, of thy birth and blood. Thy brother Indian is by birth as good. Of one blood God made him and thee and all, as wise, as fair, as strong, as personal. This dude was a badass. Keep in mind that this was the era in which white Europeans were developing the belief that different races were significantly different from one another. It would grow into full-blown scientific racism, but most white settlers truly believed that the Native Americans were inferior, more animal than human. His book, amazingly, became a bestseller and made him a celebrity in England, and all of this made it easier for him to secure a charter for his colony. Side note, the next year, Roger Williams wrote another book called The Bloody Tenet of Persecution for Cause of Conscience Discussed in a Conference Between Truth and Peace. Oh, whoa, chill on the title length, Roger. Published in 1644, this book argued for a, quote, wall of separation between church and state and for state toleration of all Christian denominations, including the much-hated Catholics, and also state toleration for, quote, paganish, Jewish, Turkish, or anti-Christian consciences and worship. Hold up. Roger Williams said that the state should protect the freedom of Catholics, Jews, Muslims, and anti-Christians, which I can only assume means atheists? I can't believe this guy wasn't killed by a bunch of Puritans. Let's be honest, if he was a woman, he totally would have been called a witch. Okay, so Roger Williams advocated for true religious freedom and tolerance, kindness and respect for Native Americans. His colony was also the only one that directly elected its governor, meaning the governor was not royally appointed, but chosen by the people. But also, there's more? He also opposed slavery? Ugh, marry me, Roger Williams. In the 1640s, all around him, the New England colonies were passing laws officially making slavery legal. In his settlement of Providence, he banned slavery, and he pushed for his entire Rhode Island colony, now a collection of a few settlements, to formally ban the practice. However, the other towns refused, and the Rhode Island colony, especially the town of Newport, became a hub for American ships carrying slaves into the colonies. Even though Rhode Island didn't end up becoming a beacon for abolition, Williams was supported in that endeavor by another nearby settlement called Portsmouth, founded by a lady, what? Who also stirred up trouble in Massachusetts in, you guessed it, 1636. Anne Hutchinson was born in England to an Anglican cleric who gave her a surprisingly good education for a woman. Ha, <laughs> that was his first mistake. She went on to have 11 kids, oh my god, and she and her husband became big fans of a Puritan minister named John Cotton. They followed him to Boston, where Anne became a midwife who also hosted weekly gatherings of women at her home. Basically, she would break down and provide commentary on the recent sermons to the women who weren't allowed at town meetings, giving her the title of spiritual advisor. She was essentially doing a live podcast explaining the important events of the day to settlers who didn't have the time or knowledge to follow the news. Wait... Am I Anne Hutchinson? Eventually, her meetings became so popular that she started hosting discussions for prominent men in the colony as well, including the governor of the Massachusetts colony. Whoa, good job, Anne. Now, here's where she got herself into trouble. She also started spreading a new philosophy, free grace theology. Now, Anne didn't develop this theology, but she was a prominent supporter of it. Essentially, Hutchinson argued that anyone is promised eternal life the moment they believe in Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. This was in direct contrast to Puritan teachings that said there was a covenant of works. Basically, you had to work your whole life and constantly act appropriately to be admitted into heaven. It's interesting because in this way, Anne Hutchinson was like a Protestant of a Protestant. What I mean is that about a hundred years earlier, Martin Luther had objected to the Catholic Church's extreme hierarchy and controlled entrance into heaven, most notably with the sale of indulgences. So he broke away and preached that the only requirement for getting into heaven was to believe in God and be a true Christian. Now, a century later, the Puritan leadership is hierarchical and incredibly strict, controlling who is admitted to the church, who has a voice in their government, and how people need to act to get into heaven. And Anne Hutchinson is like Martin Luther 2.0, saying, yeah, I don't think that's how it works. But she was a woman, so they called her a witch. And I mean, 
She did claim to be a prophet who received direct revelations from God, and she did prophesy during her trial that God would judge Massachusetts by wiping the colony from existence. And she did say that personal experience and revelations from God were equal to the word of the Bible. And I mean, yeah, that's pretty much heresy. So she was politely asked to leave, and by that I mean she was banished forever. Roger Williams saw all of this happening and was like, that's my kind of lady. So he invited Anne and her supporters to settle near him at Providence. She established a settlement of Portsmouth, but eventually had to leave after her husband died, fearing that she was still too close to the reach of Boston and the Puritan administration. She ended up in the Dutch colony of New Amsterdam, where she lived with her younger children at an ancient landmark called Split Rock, now the Bronx in New York City. Tensions between the Dutch and nearby Native Americans were high, and in 1643, while Roger Williams was traveling around England as a famed author and Thomas Hooker was leading the Connecticut colony, Anne Hutchinson, along with six of her children, were massacred by Suwanoi Indians. The only surviving member of her family was her nine-year-old daughter, Susanna, who was taken captive. And I mean, that seems like an appropriate ending for the one woman in our story who actually tried to live her life with the confidence of a white dude. So what is Anne's legacy? Well, like most things, it's changed over time. At the time, the Puritans called her a, quote, hell-spawned agent of destructive anarchy, which sounds like a badass lyric from an 80s metal band, but whatever. In 19th century America, especially as the abolition and women's suffrage movement grew, she was a crusader for liberty and individual rights. In 1850, Nathaniel Hawthorne published The Scarlet Letter, and many literary critics believe that Hester Prynne was inspired by Anne Hutchinson. By the 20th century, she was seen as a feminist leader who terrified the patriarchy, not because of her religious views. Again, she wasn't the only one preaching that free grace theology. She just was the loudest woman doing it. But she terrified the patriarchy because she was an assertive, highly visible woman who refused to conform to the Puritan idea of womanhood. In 1987, Massachusetts Governor Michael Dukakis formally pardoned Anne Hutchinson, revoking her order of banishment by John Winthrop 350 years earlier. Thanks, Dukakis! Anne Hutchinson's descendants include Stephen Douglas, the guy who beat out Lincoln for the Senate seat, Franklin Roosevelt, both George Bushes, Mitt Romney, and Ted Danson. And her own heritage apparently traces her ancestry back to Eleanor of Aquitaine, which should make total sense to anyone who listened to season one of this podcast. In short, I love Anne Hutchinson. Okay, so let's recap. In the South, the early colonies were founded based on adventure, exploration, land, and wealth. Southern colonists retained close ties to England out of economic necessity, since England was the only one allowed to buy their cash crops, and they needed the protection of the crown to continue to renew their business charters and protect their land. But people in the South also stayed more culturally connected to England. Many of the Southern settlers were Anglican, and since most were young single men, they planned on eventually either moving back to England to marry or bringing an English bride over to America. So this illustrates one version of the American dream, wealth and opportunity. These Southern colonists were in many ways the original rags-to-riches story, especially since many of them were prisoners, indentured servants, or just from the lower social classes back home. And it's important to note that this wealth was built on the backs of enslaved Africans, but we'll go way more into that in a few episodes. In New England, we see the earliest colonies founded on the basis of religious zeal and a desire to build a new community that would reflect true Christian values. These settlers were often families. They were fleeing persecution or seeking more religious independence, and so they did not stay as connected to England. Once they got here, very few intended to go back. Their version of the American dream was freedom, but a very narrow type of freedom. Freedom to practice their version of Christianity, not religious freedom carte blanche. And New Englanders don't need slave labor in the same way that the South thinks they do. Their soil is rocky, their farms are small, so they don't really have use for enslaved Africans like on massive plantations. But the New England coastline was perfectly suited for shipping and trade, so they were happy to make money as the middlemen, receiving newly arrived Africans and selling them to southern plantation owners for a profit. Over time, the New England economy developed differently. It relied on trade and eventually manufacturing rather than large-scale agriculture. The northern colonies would grow into their role as a center of trade, and they would chafe under the mercantilist policies that required them to only trade with England much more than the South, who was in general happy to have a steady market for their cash crops. Already, we should be noticing two paths, the North and the South diverging. 
They're not incompatible yet. Both want to be mostly left alone to practice their religion or work their land as they see fit. But from the beginning, the culture, ideology, and general founding philosophy of the northern and southern colonies was different. But I'm sure that won't cause any problems down the road. And there were those who saw America as a true land of opportunity for all, for all Christians, even for non-Christians, for Native Americans, for women. These voices were in the minority, but I want us to know that they were there. For now, one thing is clear. All of the colonies were founded because the new settlers wanted some form of freedom and independence. Whether it was escaping the rigid class structure of England to find economic opportunity, freedom to practice your form of Christianity without persecution, or true freedom from old world power structures, all early Americans had that in common. And so even though the colonies were founded for different reasons and developed distinct cultures, they will be able to unite for a while when that liberty and independence from the oppressive forces in England is threatened. Is that George's music I hear? Join me next time in my episode on the American Revolution. For a transcript of today's episode and classroom resources, check out www.antisocialstudies.org. And if you want more anti-social studies content, especially current events, go join my Patreon page. And help me spread the word by following me on Facebook and Instagram at Anti-Social Studies. And give me a rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.